Greetings. Welcome to today's webcast entitled, The Sneaky Influence of Clay Minerals on Formation Evaluation, presented by Dr. Jack Thomas. I'm Haley Thomas Petraskills, and I will be your moderator today. Dr. Jack Thomas has more than 45 years of diverse work experiences in which he has conducted or worked on hydrocarbon projects in most of the active petroleum-bearing basins of the world. He is recognized as an expert in reservoir characterization of conventional and unconventional reservoirs, including those in tight gas, coal bed methane, all types of siliclastic and carbonate reservoirs. He has presented seminars in more than 26 nations on aspects of these topics. He has authored or co-authored two books on applied and practical petrophysics, plus numerous papers on the topic. His academic teaching experiences have been in the areas of petrology, petrophysics, and environmental geology. He was recognized as a Society of Petroleum Engineers Distinguished Lecturer in 1995, traveling Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and the United States, focusing on the importance of rock log calibration and reservoir characterization. He received his bachelor's and master's degree from Miami of Ohio University and a PhD from the University of Oklahoma. Jack, we're so glad that you could be with us here today, and the floor is now yours. Thanks, Haley. I really appreciate it. And hello, everybody. Uh, what I want to talk about really is the sneaky influence of clay minerals on formation evaluation. And it's not just a case of calculating the clay. Sounds kind of simple, but let's see how we go through this. First of all, if we look at a calculation for hydrocarbon volume, uh, the simple expression includes uh, reservoir volume, a net to gross ratio, a porosity parameter, and then a water saturation parameter. And if you look at the little diagram down below, it says that we have to figure out H uh, for area by knowing the clay versus the sand or sandstone uh, that is present. And so what we have here is really a very subtle influence of the presence of clays and it's important for us to figure out what the volume of clay is. Uh, we're dealing with uh, a reservoir that contains oil and water and matrix. So water saturation, porosity, volume, net to gross can all come from our log determinations, but what happens if the electrical and radioactive logs are off? And that is the gist of today's message. Generally what happens when we're done drilling a well is we come up with an answer log, and this answer log summarizes uh, the lithology and the fluids that are present. It quantifies the porosity, the water and oil saturation, and our estimation of the net fee to pay. But it doesn't really tell us if the apparent pay really flows, and is there really a mineralogy effect on the logs? And then what does it mean, therefore, for the water saturation calculation. In other words, does this really mean uh, SW is water saturation? And so is it a core calibrated log? And it's really important, if you don't like the word core, try the word rock calibrated result. Ultimately, is there a question about a sneaky clay being present? If we look at estimating V shale from a gamma ray, it should be okay, or maybe it isn't. Think about this. Shale actually is two-thirds non-clay minerals on the average, and that's across the Gulf of Mexico as an example. Seldom does V-shale equal V-clay, because V-shale is made up of things including quartz, calcite, dolomite, organic material, and each one of these things uh, may or may not be seen by the gamma ray response. So V shale doesn't really equal V clay. V shale is estimated from the gamma ray data, but it can have differing results because of the way we calculate the gamma ray index. And the gamma ray index is simply the ratio of the average readings in nearby clean sands and nearby 100% shales. And you can see from the figure on the right that different scientists have calculated the uh, V clay differently or the V shale differently, uh, be it Thomas Stiber, Bateman, Clavier, or the original linear. So V really V clay and may be somewhat misleading. Now, there are different kinds of clays that are present. <clears throat> there are detrital clays, 
These would be the clays that are transported like muddy water off the Mississippi River or the Ganges or, or uh, any other major river of the world. But they are transported in. They are inherited from the source terrain. Orthogenic clays, on the other hand, actually crystallize in place, that is, in the pore system, and are really the main influencers on our log responses. There are over 200 different clay minerals, and they are broken into five major groups, that is, the kaolinites, the illites, the montmorillonites, chlorites, and mixed layer clays. All of them contain aluminum, silicon, oxygen, hydrogen, and unique therefore characteristics that affect the reservoirs. And so we're going to talk about each of those in uh, different nature. All right, how do we determine what these clay minerals are? We can go with logs and do a multi-mineral type of log analysis, and then what we are doing is we are looking for primarily the presence of illite or smectite. Kaolinite abundance, therefore, might be overlooked, and we'll talk about this in a second. Chlorite and mixed layer clays can be underreported or overlooked. If we look at core based analyses or rock based analyses, we have different types of analytic techniques. Of course, X ray diffraction is good for detecting the mixtures of the different clays that are present. And what we get is really relative abundances, either reported as a weight percent or a volume percent. And it should be considered only as a relative abundance. If we use scanning electron microscopy or tunneling microscopy, it is good for locating and identifying the clay crystals in the pore system and to help understand the flow behavior uh, in that reservoir sample, but it doesn't really tell us the same uh, relative abundances that we see by x-ray. If we go through and look at thin sections for studying the presence or absence of clays, we can identify the layering and the general abundances, but again, we don't have the relative abundances that we get from x-ray. Another technique called FTIR, or Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, uh, will identify clays, and again, it will report as a relative abundance. FTIR is not going to be the same thing as the abundance reported by x-ray diffraction. So we have a little bit of a problem here. Now let's look at these individual clays and see if this helps you a little bit. For example, orthogenic kaolinite, as you can see in the photograph to the left, uh, commonly forms in a depositional setting which is a deeply weathered soil profile, uh, a well-drained soil such as a lateritic soil in the tropics. And it's especially prevalent in granitic areas. It's a two-layer clay uh, in clay structure, and it contains these hydrogen-rich booklets, or cards, as you can see, uh, stacked up in the middle of this pore, and they're generally found in pores. At the photograph, or in the photograph, at the, in the upper left-hand corner, you see a pore throat that is largely devoid of any orthogenic kaolinite. Kaolinite can move and brush pile on completion, uh, with the introduction of a fluid into the pore system. This example is taken from Grieve Field in Wyoming, which is thought to be a barrier bar. We can look at the illite group, and in the illite group, we're looking at a common depositional setting, which is marine, and uh, near shore to offshore marine, and in potassium-rich environments otherwise, such as uh, the unusual interior drainage basins of uh, New Mexico and East Africa. It's a three-layer clay containing radioactive potassium-40. Not all of the potassium is radioactive, but there is a natural uh, mineral fraction, ionic fraction of potassium uh, that is present. It's generally found coating the pore walls or the pore throats and occurs as a series of fibers as you see here uh, for example, where the red arrow is, or it can be a series of flakes. And these flakes and fibers can brush pile in pore throats on completion. This example is taken from the Yewa sandstone in Texas. The smectite or montmorillonite, or bentonite as some people call it, uh, is a clay that is the finest in crystal size of all the clays, 
and it commonly is found in shallow marine environments, especially near volcanic-rich uplands. It, like illite, is a three-layer clay, but the cations that are contained, the principal cations, are sodium, calcium, and magnesium. Commonly, this clay will coat the pore walls and the throats of the pores, and as you can see, these tiny flakes are actually going to be great traps for water. So uh, it increases the cation exchange capacity in the surface area that one would expect in a uh, sandstone reservoir. If you introduce fresh water in your drilling fluid, it will cause that clay, the smectite, to expand and it's going to plug pores. It's more difficult to remediate than uh, the illite or kaolinite bearing sandstone reservoirs. This example is from a volcanoclastic sandstone reservoir in California called the Markley Sandstone. The chloride group uh, is a common type of clay that is found in organic rich marine sandstones. Uh, it's a three layer clay, it's rich in magnesium and iron, uh, particularly sedimentary chloride, and it occurs as a series of blades on poor walls as you see here, again where the red arrow is, is located on that photo, you can see the blade standing on end, or it can occur as cabbage heads in pores. That is a little more unusual. The chloride problem is that it dissolves in the presence of hydrochloric acid, and the resultant gel is going to coat pore throats, and that gel is largely insoluble. Uh, only hydrofluoric acid can clean that up, and that is a uh, environmentally uh, a damaging situation. It therefore is a problem in reservoirs uh, that are low resistivity and is really the, the, the culprit play for low resistivity reservoir identification. In the Yewa in Texas. Now, let's talk about the electrical properties a little bit. In the beginning of the uh, petrophysics uh, investigation of the relationship between electrical properties and uh, porosity and saturation, uh, Gus Archie conducted his experiments and those experiments allowed him to vary porosity or water saturation or total rock resistivity or water saturation and hold the other variables constant. So by doing that, he was able to establish a relationship between SW, water saturation, RW, the water resistivity, porosity at, uh, with some sort of cementation exponent called M, true resistivity, and uh, looking at a saturation exponent. So knowing that, uh, this is an electrical relationship between a conductive brine and originally glass beads, but then later pieces of rock, done in the laboratory under controlled conditions. So the clay abundance, the chemistry, and the trapped water that we're concerned about are all something that can affect resistivity of the formation. And as I said before, that is really a problem with the chloride type of reservoir. We can get clues for these different clays uh, by looking at, or at least how to remediate these, these clays, by looking at the header for a log that is being run on a well. We can find out, for example, what the mud recipe is, that is, what type of mud we are drilling with, what the pH is of that mud, what the fluid loss of the mud was at the time of testing, the viscosity of the mud, the thickness of the mud cake, the resistivities of the different properties, the mud, the fluid, the, the resistivity, the mud, the mud filtrate, and so on, and the time since we stopped drilling and logs were run. We also have a segment of the log header that includes remarks, and it's all, always useful to know what particular tools were run and what the rat hole was, that length of the rat hole. Certainly in the, in the era of multiple logging tools run at once, like a quad combo or a triple combo, we are concerned that all tools are going to pass over the zone of interest 
especially if it's down at the bottom of the well. If not, what happens is that the uh, logging tools are really giving non-response to a particular concern uh, or zone of interest. Now, just a, a quick discussion about the invasion effect. The vertical axis is increasing from bottom to top. So you can see that the depth of invasion increases over time after a zone has been penetrated. At the same time, the rate of invasion goes down, high initially, and then going down uh, progressively. And it changes when we trip, obviously, because we are changing out drill bits and there is no circulating mud. The mud thickness is increasing, and when we stop circulation between drilling intervals, what we do is we allow the mud cake thickness to increase. Now, how important is that? The thicker the mud cake, the less likely it is that our X-centered or borehole wall tools, such as the density log, are going to be affected, are going to be effective in measuring the density, the bulk density, at that particular location. We can look at the resistivity in the borehole, and we, you've, this is a classic diagram that has been seen for a long time. We've got varying resistivity in the flush zone, the transition zone or annulus, and the adjacent bed. And what we're really trying to do, and this is where log analysis does a great job, is to look at the contrast between the true formation resistivities and the resistivities in the partially and completely flush zones around the wellbore. <clears throat> so it becomes a question in vertical and horizontal wells, what is the depth of investigation of a particular logging tool and what is its vertical resolution in a vertical wellbore? And you can see on the right-hand side uh, the example for a horizontal wellbore where the depth of investigation really goes into the underlying and overlying uh, zones that have been penetrated and then are being logged at this point. The different families of logging tools, and what I've done is I've, I've sketched this for the vertical wellbore. Uh, the vertical wellbore has resolution that varies from something on the order of two centimeters to about 80 centimeters, and depths of investigation from somewhere around four or five centimeters all the way out to about 80 centimeters. And so running combination logs in a well, you are going to be dealing with tools that are analyzing different volumes of rock, and all of this has to be taken into the mathematical reduction of data that log analysts do or petrophysicists do in the evaluation of a well. Notice that the micro resistivity devices, such as the micro log, the dip meter, the image log, all of those have very shallow depths of investigation and uh, very, very shallow resolution intervals. So, what does that mean for looking at logs that uh, are affected by clay? Let's take the example of the low resistivity pay. Look for the presence of chloride or pyrite causing low resistivity pay. The shallowest investigation tool, such as a spherically focused log or an image log, is going to be looking somewhat serrated because of the interlamination of the conducting and the non-conducting clays. The density neutron cross plots, cross plots that can be made in this interval will suggest that this is a calcareous sandstone. In other words, it looks like it's a more dense rock than a true quartz sandstone. And it is going to be somewhat misleading. Let the cross plot tell you what is, what is indicated rather than saying this is simply a calcareous sandstone. If we are in a zone that contains a mica such as muscovite or illite, then what we will find is that the interval will have a higher gamma ray count than, say, a clean sandstone, quartz-rich sandstone, and it will look like a shale. Therefore, it affects the gamma ray index that we talked about earlier. The hydrocarbon resistivity in that zone, if it's bearing hydrocarbons, is going to be high, but the conclusion is that it will look wet on the gamma ray curve. 
Now, don't blame the logging tool for that. What the logging tool is telling us that there is a source of radioactivity in this interval. If it's a kaolinite rich sandstone, especially occurring under coals, such as in southwestern United States, the high hydrogen will present in the kaolinite will suggest that there is gas, but it is really due to the presence of the kaolinite. The neutron tool is also, therefore, a hydrogen index tool, and it's going to give a false reading suggesting that there is gas truly present. If we had a situation where we're looking at a montmorillonite or smectite rich reservoir, uh, the problem is more a case of high water saturation uh, because of the high surface area. And so if this is drilled with a freshwater based mud, you can expect sticking in this interval as the clay swells. And you can expect that the bulk density is going to be averaging lower than a true clean sandstone. So again, it's something different. In carbonates, clays are not as much a problem. Uh, it's commonly 2 to 3% clay in a carbonate reservoir is high. But most commonly, when those clays are present, they are going to be illite or a detrital clay. And the detrital clays are com most commonly illite or smectite. So what you look for are the clay accumulations either at sequence boundaries or unconformities or along stylolites uh, where the concentration of illite is quite common. Uh, usually associated with the illite in a stylolite, of course, is the presence of magnetite. Again, this is going to change the conductivity, resistivity nature of that interval in the carbonate. So, knowing the invasion depth of a drilling mud is critical to understanding if the logging tools are truly measuring formation properties. We're talking about the shallowest investigation tools. The vertical resolution differences between tool families improves interpreting thin bed pay once you know that difference. And therefore, we're talking, as a prime example, low resistivity pay zones containing iron bearing chloride. So sneaky clays can affect log responses and the estimation of hydrocarbon pore volumes. Going back to the equation that we saw initially. Here's an example of a clay-rich sandstone reservoir from Argentina. In this case, the reservoir was bypassed for a long period of time because everybody thought it was a wet sandstone. But in reality, it was a combination of the clays and zeolites, which are clay-like. Uh, that was affecting the log response, and in fact, this became um, a good economic reservoir for gas and oil. So, how do we prepare for this? Well, you can prepare for it uh, or, or plug in your information at three different levels. First of all, pre-drilling. Know what the depositional setting is for the target lithologies. Know the source area for sediment coming into that uh, the area where the reservoir was formed, or the apparent reservoir was formed. You can ask for any clay mineral data that might exist for that target reservoir in the area uh, or in a similar depositional setting. And then you can modify the drilling fluid program to accommodate the potential damaging clays. Uh, so we're talking about clay compatibility, fluid loss, and also the pH. If we are into the point where we're drilling through the target zone and we need to test our pre-drill model, if we have core, ask yourself, what is the mineralogy of that core? In other words, are there clays present? If you have only cuttings, and especially circulated cuttings, you can analyze by X-ray or FTIR very quickly and determine what those uh, clay minerals are that are present, if there are clay minerals present. And then you can compare the mineralogy that from those data with the gas curves, uh, really the lithology reported on the mud log against the gas curves. And then that will allow you to anticipate how better to evaluate your core, uh, your logs, when you have completed the well. And on completion, you want to make sure that you have compatibility of any stimulation fluids with the formation fluids and the formation mineralogy. Simply stated, 
but really it's a time-consuming uh, thought process. So the sneaky clay challenge is this. Do you know the reservoir mineralogy? Do you know the drilling fluids that are employed? Do you know the completion and stimulation techniques that have been or will be employed? Do you recognize that hydrocarbon reservoirs are not simply quartz sandstones or pure limestones or dolomites? This is especially true in unconventional reservoirs being drilled today with long reach or long extent laterals. And do you know the methods of remediation for formation damage are much more expensive um, and therefore impact the economics of wells that are drilled? So why not prepare before you drill into a reservoir by knowing the potential for these sneaky clays being present. The topics that we discuss in today's reservoir webinar are covered in many of the courses at PetroSkills, particularly Foundations of Petrophysics, Shaley Sand Petrophysics, and Well Log Interpretation. But other courses that, that include the, the subject matter would be formation damage and the petrophysics of unconventional reservoirs. So for more information and to find your next course, visit our website at www.petroskills.com. Thanks very much and I appreciate your time.